The year is 1630. William Lord, the Bishop of London, muses on the state of religion in England. Are we a godly people? I would hope so. Though some foreigner inspecting our shores might look hard for an outward sign of this godliness. Our churches are all fallen into decay. There are windows broken, floors filthy as any cowsheds. Squires will bring their dogs and hawks to divine service. And I've heard of one parish where the tombstones were all ripped up and used to press cheese. True. Important as religion was, churches had fallen into disrepair. Not only the buildings, but the clergy too were in a poor state. In the village where I was born, the ministers were poor, ignorant men, and most of them led scandalous lives. One was about 80 years of age and never preached. Another was our neighbor's son, who was no more than a common drunkard. But all this was not through any lack of religious feeling. Faith still played a vital part in people's lives. When I was very hot in labor with my firstborn, I felt I would surely die, the pain was so great. And I fixed my mind on my Savior, Jesus Christ, and I prayed for his salvation, and he was with me. I felt his hand wipe my brow, and his whisper, not yet and the pain was gone. I dedicate my life to his worship. I will strive against sin. I will praise God always, and he will keep me well. Such belief spurred people on in their determination to fix the church's problems. King Charles I, as head of the church, felt it his duty to improve things. It has always been our care, since we came to the throne, to encourage our subjects to repair and beautify their churches as evidence of their faith. Charles's first step was to make William Lord his Archbishop of Canterbury. To glorify God, we must glorify the church, for the church is God's house on earth. So. What has fallen into decay, we will restore. What lies ruined, we will raise up again, rich and wonderful. We will build always with an eye to what is glorious and uplifting. And God will see how we magnify him and delight in our work. But Lord's reforms did more than restore the church. They split the country. Why? Staunton Herald Church in Leicestershire, a perfect example of a church built to the Lordian design. Organs were installed and choir boys chosen, for the service was now to include singing. No expense was to be spared in making the church beautiful to glorify God. Candles, carvings, rich wall hangings, stained glass windows. The priest was to wear special clothes to mark them off from the congregation, but by far the biggest change was the moving of the altar. The high altar, God's own table, should be treated with respect. Altars are not for gossips to sit around and chat or for schoolboys to dump their satchels on. So, we insist they be moved out of the reach of the rude multitude and screened off with a railing so that dogs may not get in. And when one approaches the altar, one should bow. A little nod will suffice. For I've always found in religion the more ceremony, the better. Many enjoyed the changes to their churches, but from others there was a storm of protest. Our communion table's been in the centre of church long as I can remember. Vickers says he wants to move it, make of it an altar. Let him try. 
I'll burn his house down. The vicar wants to cover the altar with cloth. If he does that, I'll peg up my laundry in the chancel. I was helped by the town clerk and his wife in splashing a bucket of tar over the distasteful altar hangings of Litchfield Cathedral. It's so wasteful. Many a pound has been spent on priests' gowns, organs, stained glass windows and other things unnecessary, while the poor go unfed. Laud was only trying to glorify God. Why such anger? Because, 100 years before, the English state had broken away from the Catholic Church. England was Protestant. But with his stress on decoration and ornaments, Laud seemed to be returning to the old ways. Does it not have a smell to you? It has a smell to me. And the smell is paupery. It's my belief that Archbishop Lord is a Catholic. And he would have us all become, like him, Catholic. And the King loves him because the King is Catholic. Why, I heard the Queen entices him to Mass. I heard 100 servants of Rome reside at court. 100 traitors. But has it not been shown that Catholics plot against the state? Yet these are the people that advise the king. Why this fear of Catholics? In the reign of King James, Catholics had plotted to overthrow the crown. In the time of the Catholic Queen Mary, Protestants had been burnt at the stake, and their individual sufferings were recorded in the most popular book in Britain after the Bible, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Kirby was brought before the Catholic commissioners who said to him, Remember, the fire is hot and the pain will be extreme. Better to admit your Protestant beliefs are wrong and embrace the Catholic faith. Kirby answered, be at my burning and you shall say, there standeth a Christian soldier in the fire. Anti-Catholic hysteria raged and rumors spread throughout the country. The Popish believers are greatly increased in their number. We fear there are dangers both to church and state, for these Catholics will never rest until they have destroyed our true Protestant religion. Lord wasn't a Catholic, but his reforms made him appear so to many. But if not Lord's path, what was an alternative way to worship God? What do we believe? Not in a church where godliness is measured by appearance and outward show. God sees through all that. If a priest is foul, no fancy linen will hide that foulness. For you see, God is within every one of us. And bowing and kneeling and ornament, all this gets in the way. We do not need all this. It clogs up what should be a clear and personal pathway to salvation. Who is she? A Puritan. One of a growing number of people who believed that religion could not be confined to a church, or controlled by the clergy or bishops, but should be part of everything they did. We could not read the scriptures in our family without the great disturbance of the noise in the street from dancing under the maypole. Sometimes my thoughts broke loose from my prayer and I wished to join them, but when I heard them call my father Puritan, I considered my father's Bible reading better than their merrymaking. Sunday was strictly a day for prayer. Preachers warned of the terrible punishments that befell those who broke the rule. A farmer grinding corn upon the Lord's day had his cornmeal burnt to ashes. Another carrying corn on this day had his barn and all his corn therein burnt with fire from heaven the next night. Our purpose is to save souls from hell. To achieve this, we must rid ourselves of sin. So, daily we examine ourselves that evil thoughts might be purged as with a sword of fire. On Sundays we will hear at least three sermons, and when a true minister of Christ visits and thunders against superstition and sin, oh then tears run down my cheeks and I come home rejoicing. Langley Chapel in Shropshire. It has stood unchanged for nearly 500 years. To a Puritan, the worship of God was through sermons and the plain, unaccompanied singing of psalms. They saw no need for fancy decoration.
The pulpit and not the altar was central to the service. From the pulpit, preachers gave their own views of religion in sermons that could sometimes last hours. In the churches we run, for yes, we run them ourselves, we would not have bishops choose our ministers for us. In the churches we run, we sit in silence and pray and hear a good sermon delivered. And this is worship at its most perfect. Perfect but dangerous. By rejecting the king's bishops, the Puritans were seen to be rejecting the king himself. As an anti-Puritan rhyme of the time put it. A Puritan's a monstrous thing. As loves the people, hates the king. A Puritan, to all intent, would cross the king in Parliament. <laughs> yes, yes, it is very so. Puritans are perfect scoundrels. To them, a barn is as good as a church. Their sermons are mere rabble-rousing. And so we shall ban these unnecessary sermons. There shall be but one per week on the Lord's Day. And it shall be a plain reading on the need for obedience, say, without opinion. Many ministers continued to preach despite Laud's orders, but they were taking a risk. Archbishop Laud was prepared to use the church courts to enforce his commands. A confrontation seemed ever more likely. Persons of honor and great quality were every day brought before the church court. They were treated harshly and frequently sent to prison. The shame this brought was never forgotten and they watched for revenge. One of the people brought before the church court was a Puritan barrister called William Prynne. He had written over 200 books and made several attacks on Lord and the bishops. It's not us who are the traitors, it's the bishops who try us. There are more traitors amongst them than any other rank of men in the world. Why do we put up with them? Other reformed churches sacked them long ago. You see why I complain? The bishops are hand in hand with the king. Does it not then follow that this man, Prynne, would put an end to kingship itself? He's dangerous, and so we have brought him to justice. The verdict was clear, guilty. And the sentence, methinks, will put pay to other rogues printing such ideas. The tops of his ears are to be sliced off, and for the remainder of his days, he will rot in some forgotten corner of the Tower of London and be done with it. But things wouldn't rest so easily. Prynne continued to attack Lord from the Tower. Three years later, in 1637, he was again charged and found guilty of criticizing the church. Prynne was brought forth to suffer his sentence. His cheeks were branded with a hot iron which done, the executioner, in a cruel manner, with much blood, cut off both his ears. He bore his suffering like a true saint and said, the more I am beat down, the more I am lift up. The savage sentences given to men like Prynne created sympathy for the Puritans and made them hate Lord. Our lives are made a misery. We are hemmed in on all sides by bishop and judge. There are many brothers and sisters that have made their way to the ports to take a ship to the new world, America, to carve their lives afresh. They say the crossing is very hard, but to stay behind, is that not harder? And so I go. Thousands left England to escape Lord's oppression. What had started as an attempt to revive the church had begun to split the country. Undaunted, Laud turned his attention to Scotland, a move that was to bring about his downfall. Scotland was a separate country from England, but both were ruled by King Charles. The Scots, too, believed in simple worship. So how would they react to Laud's ideas? Laud will never enforce his English prayer book on Scotland. The book has so many changes to the order of service that it is more like a Roman Catholic mass than a Protestant service. I was at the Kirk of St. Giles. I'd got there early and I was right at the front. 
first there was a hiss, and that was the Dean processing up the aisle and the people muttering. And he looked a right stuffed shirt. His wrath was fresh starched. And then, of course, as we'd been told, he opened the new English prayer book with some pride and dignity, and he began to read. And I'll tell you what I did. I stood up and I shouted, ye papist, you'll not read the mass in my ear. And I chucked my stool at him and caught him four square on the nords. It was a riot. Everyone then started hurling prayer books and footstools and stones and dung. And the dean backs out of the church all specked with spit. And so it began, all Scotland rising in rebellion. After the riot at St. Giles, thousands of Scots, nobles and poor alike, flocked to Edinburgh to sign a national covenant in which they swore to protect their religion from Lord's reforms. In the year 1638, we, the people of Scotland, do promise and declare that we shall, with all our means and our lives, defend our true Protestant religion and the King's majesty according to the laws of our kingdom. Some wept aloud. Some raised a shout as from the field of battle and victory. Some, after their signatures, added the words, till death. Some opened their veins and signed their names with their blood. Our church in Scotland is very fine. We have a very fine family of believers, a very godly family. This prayer book would tear the fabric. England would dictate how we should face our God. We will not have it so. This is our argument. This is all our argument, nothing more. We pose no threat to the king. But you see, I have two kings, and King Charles must realize that Christ the king holds an authority greater than any earthly ruler, and we will fight to keep it so. The Scots gathered an army and invaded England. Charles needed to raise his own army to stop them and was forced to call a parliament but many of the MPs arriving in London violently disagreed with Laud's changes. Rather than wanting to raise an army against the Scots, they sympathized with them. What they wanted was for the king to listen to their own complaints. I shall explain to you one of our greatest grievances which afflict the country. It is the changes in matters of religion. The introduction of popish ceremonies, of altars, crosses, crucifixes and the like. 800 parishes complained to the new Parliament of Lords' reforms. Parliament set about undoing the changes. Lord was arrested and charged. Like a traitor, he has tried to ruin the true religion and replaced it with Catholic ideas. He has brought in Catholic ceremonies without any agreement and he has cruelly persecuted those who have opposed him. I was much surprised at being called to trial. They say I wanted to turn the nation to slavery. So many hurtful things, so many lies. All I wanted was to glorify God in my own humble fashion. I must put my trust in him. He is my rock. He is my refuge. Lord had failed. The order of religion had been challenged. Was it the end of the confusion, or just the beginning? Ahead to Thursday. Now on BBC Two, the making of the United Kingdom in the History File. I 